So I want to say a few words, and if you save your questions, it'll be great, because I, um, I want to say a few words just to get the questions you know, forming in your minds, I guess. And um, I'm a teacher, uh, but um, I've only taught 50%. I've only taught half time uh, for over 30 years. And um, it was my choice because um, I wanted the other half of the time to be in the studio. But in order to um, give, in order to um, do that, I had to give up a middle class life, which means um, no retirement. It means sketchy health insurance. And I never once had any regret or desire to move away from this position. Um, I have teachers myself. Uh, still in my studio, and they are um, heroes and heroines, and they really give me uh, courage and also ideas of how to proceed. Um, I'll mention a few of them. Um, one of them is Kiki Smith. So Kiki Smith, um, I learned from their lives as well as their work. Kiki, uh, a little anecdote from her life is that I, I read in a journal someplace that she, she appeared barefoot in New York City uh, at a friend's door with a bottle of whiskey in her hand. <laughs> so it does show me that desperation creates art. Without that, you may not have the energy to keep on doing it. Um, and also, I love the fact that she didn't worry that her work was fragile at all. She said, I can repair it. <laughs> and so um, I, I had some courage to have slightly <coughs> fragile work. I do put <clears throat> five to seven coats of picture varnish on every piece. You could spill something on it and mop it up. For <laughs> sure. <laughs> and if something falls off of it, it can be replaced, and that was her attitude as well. Um, and her drawing, Kiki Smith's drawings, are less than Raphael. No, she wasn't going to get better at it because she only drew as well as was needed for her ideas. And I, I don't know if I could draw as well as Raphael, but I never went in that direction. I love to draw, and. Uh, I want to draw just enough to get my idea across. And that goes with everything else. So there's a slight roughness to the individual ways of laying things down. And that's the way I want it. Uh, and that's the way Kiki Smith wants it too. So she gave me those ideas. Another hero is um, Charles Garabedian. And he just recently died in Los Angeles. Um, He's a, um, a displaced Armenian, and it was the subject of a lot of his work in a way. But he, has, he had crazy compositions. I wanted to be like him, but I never really could get there. I, never, I wanted to be a little bit like him with his um, dreamlike, imaginative compositions. I only move toward it. Uh, another uh, hero of mine is Jim Dine. Um, and so Jim Dine, um, he uh, is so, he's a macho, sensitive man. <laughs> and it was a, I once heard a lecture of his in San Francisco. He said, um, I don't care if Roberta Smith thinks my work is shit. She's the reviewer for the New York Times, okay? So then, and so then, um, that's how he talks, but yet he was so sensitive that he had a nervous breakdown in New York City when they pigeonholed him into pop art. <laughs> and he felt he couldn't live there anymore. He had to run away and in secl into secl seclusion and so on. Another thing about Jim Dine, too, is that every time he goes to Europe, he goes to work right away. Mm -hmm. And so it's just, uh, he doesn't take vacations. He just keeps on working. I think I've heard his marriage, but his marriage is still together, so that's good. <laughs> he's, he's exactly my age. Um, 
Robert Rauschenberg, who is also uh, dead, but uh, his combines, meaning he took uh, found materials and put them together, and you have to be a genius, and just with some flat splashes of paint, you have to have, be a genius to get a dead bird and an old quilt and a piece of an old wagon and put it together. You have to be a genius to put those things together. Yeah, his work is enough to break your heart. So he's another hero of mine too. Um, Julia Cousins is a local uh, heroine for me. Um, she's so brave that she could take um, ordinary materials, wrap them and spin them into, sew them and everything into uh, something that is both terrifying and beautiful at the same time. And I never, I'm just too ingratiating to ever get there, but I'd like to make s tougher, tougher work. <laughs> so those are, and this is just a, just a few. In the past I've had Max Beckman um, and, um, and also um, Philip Guston. So that's so long in the past. But they were they were heroes of mine. And notice there are just two women I mentioned. Well, the two women is because of a birth control. Birth control did not happen. Women did not enter the art uh, art world. They were home with uh, babies uh, and so on and so forth. And so I'm old enough so that my I had to have heroes. I, I was looking for heroines, but they there weren't enough of them. And now there are enough. And that's been true since the 1960s, but some of these uh, men were a lot older, you know, in the other era. Um, I'm not very derivative in spite of having these heroes. Luckily, I don't know why, but I have some ideas, and that is because I go into the studio and I just start. Uh, and it's often starting with a pour. I just pour the watercolor, it's stapled to the floor, and I just pour it. Um, unlike Helen Frankenthaler, I can't tip it <laughs> and make it into uh, shapes like she did. But um, I just have to let it go, and the next day I come in, and I see what's happened. And especially with this one that I'm standing in front of, I made these um, blooms and watermarks, and then I had to deal with them. <laughs> and so, um, that's how I want to begin, just to have those obstacles. Um, so each mark that I put down tells me what next. Otherwise, I have no plan. So it would be, it's kind of hard for me to be derivative if I don't have any plan at all. It's, it's who I am, it's who I am. And then um, I might start with an idea. The, the one that's firmest with an idea is the prostitute from Ephraim. And so then I, that's the most narrative one, but you can make up stories about any of these, they're your stories. Uh, but I, um, I did have an idea with that one, but then it was, it was uh, made in a similar way that I'm describing too. I didn't know I would put the watch faces on there at all. I didn't know what animals or anything. I didn't know many things. But little by little, it comes about. When I put something down, um, then I know that I can use something else. And Ellen Den Fleet said I shouldn't put a funny hat in this one. <laughs> and so she was she was right. <laughs> you know, uh, it wasn't right. <laughs> so the the painting told me Ellen is right. <laughs> Take that funny hat out of there. Um, it's uh, this what next is. It's kind of like um, my going to Mali and Senegal and losing my guidebook. And so that's exactly um, how all of these are made. And it makes a great adventure. In the past, I did other work, uh, large format watercolors, and they're all gone. Uh, it took too much planning. And so I knew I needed to make a change. Uh, and that this is the change that I chose. You know, I know you can do uh, spontaneous watercolors, but somehow I couldn't grab a hold of that. It took quite a bit of planning. 
so I now I have no planning, and so it's much it's much more exciting for me. Um, some of the ones from the past are still very good, uh, and one of them is um, Mary Hamilton isn't here, but she owns one that could be in the show, uh, and uh, she um, she also owns two old ones that somehow they were a little more inspired, uh, a little looser. And so she just had a good eye. She has two old ones and one new one. And uh, they, they uh, I even, I like many of the old ones too, especially uh, those that Marion owns. And there are a few sold ones that could have been in the show. Um, now for the animals. I go to the zoos um, in Sacramento, the uh, giant anteater here, and here is the wonderful specimen that the Sacramento Zoo has. I go to the zoo in Sa San Francisco, and that's uh, this, this one, this um, Mr. Jones, the um, silverback papa at the San Francisco Zoo. Um, and uh, then I go to zoos in France. The ibis, the two ibis here are um, from a bird sanctuary in France. And so if I can have an intimate experience with the animal, it's really good. A lot of these animals are dead, um, meaning like they were shot, just like Audubon shot, the, shot. and they're, they're taxidermed. I don't, I think Audubon did taxiderm, had taxiderm, but um, I don't know for sure. But anyway, in the 1800s, the, um, there were many uh, cabinets of curiosity in Europe. And so a lot of these came from um, the um, Museum of Evolution in Paris or uh, the Natural History Museum in Rome, where I spend uh, three, uh, two and a half, to three months a year, and so I just go there. They're put they're put there for the uh, uh, school children to get close to animals, and for me with my sketchbook, I keep on going. I keep on going more and more sketches. And first, I didn't like my sketches because I'm not that good at it, uh, but good enough to capture some spirit that doesn't leave when I translate it uh, into the big paintings. And so. A good example is um, this monkey. Um, this, he was um, taxidermed. Um, the white-faced monkey uh, in the Amsterdam picture. Uh, the, um, the buzzard uh, nor from Normandy over here. The ra raptor from Paris. Um, and all these animals are uh, this one too, this monkey. Um, they're um, Mocking, kind of <laughs> reason, and they happen in low light. I don't. I know it's not just because they will be destroyed by more light, because they're already kind of destroyed. But just so they look a little bit better, because no one is shooting these animals anymore, except big hunter, big game hunters. Um, <clears throat> so I choose with my heart. I I just say, what animal am I going to fall in love with next? You know, and so I just choose my with my heart. Hello, Ellen. I don't want to embarrass you, but there's a seat over here. Um, so I just choose in my heart. And I, um, uh, animals, sometimes they, I feel they have to go together, like um, Grizzly from the New York City Zoo. Um, it has to, it had to go with songbirds. So I just pulled all the sketches I did of songbirds and then um, I ran out of them or something, and there's a little raptor right down there. I just had to put a raptor in because I didn't have any more songbirds. But usually it's kind of random, and not that random. I just have to say to myself, uh, wow, a little fox and a jackrabbit will be okay together. You know, that kind of thing is, has to do with shape, the kind of animal, my feelings toward it. So it's just, uh, as accidental as their unplanned, unplanned beginnings. The final thing is the formal design. And um, 
every, I would say that anyone who has taken <laughs> design classes, there are elements of design, you know, color, shape, darks and lights, uh, directional movement, you know, I, I teach all this stuff, and uh, texture, and I'm really bully for texture. I want the paintings to come into your world a little bit by coming out from. I have a wire basket, handmade wire basket about this big, square, and I'm gonna get it into some piece. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going out. I'm gonna, okay. Um, um, but um, every, every design decision has to support these animals. Uh, and then it, ha then it has to be a whole balanced world for them. It's just formal design things, you know. And it's not, it is not insensitive. I'm sensitive to all the creatures and everything. When I'm making the decisions, light and dark and color and shape and everything. So that's all I want to say. And then I know you have questions so that I want, I'll answer anything. It could be anything at all. I really mean you can answer, you can ask any question. It'd be, yes. I'd like to know if you work on more than one painting at a time and if you're just doing one, how, about how long it takes you to complete it? Right. I work on one at a time. And then uh, I have a big studio, 18 by 28, and I work on one at a time. I, uh, I would be distracted if I had another one on the side wall. I like the 28 feet to get back from it, and it takes me three months. I had a knee replacement um, and took a semester off from teaching, uh, just this fall semester. Um, so this one took three months, even though it's bigger, because I had a little more time. So any other question? Yes. I see that you have a lot of pieces with a lot of white space and then others that are dense. So how do you determine when you're finished? I, I um, the white space is the sky, the weather, the, he the heavens, the place for birds, for air, and so it's not unfinished for me. Um, I think I'd like to have less, cons I like the white, but when I have a feeling I need that, I need a place for birds to fly, I need a place for um, uh, trees to grow or whatever, then I leave it a space to move. But I also like this one that doesn't have, have it, because if I can get rid of the horizon line, I can change the scale a little bit better and stuff like that. And so if I get rid of that idea in my mind sometimes, I like, like it. Yes? Do you work with your work flat on the floor? Or do you, is it hanging or on an easel? It's on the, no, it's not on the easel, but it's... Um, well, they couldn't be an easel. <laughs> no, and so it's on the floor for <coughs> pouring watercolor on it. It's on the floor for attaching cheesecloth and matte medium on the back. It's on the floor for that. Uh, but then after that, my husband <laughs> fries up those staples, and then I just put it, um, he's my uh, studio assistant, and I put it on the wall, and I work it out on the wall. Once in a while, I bring it to my big table, a few things needed time on the big table, but very little. So I'm trying to think of an area where I had to put it on the big table because it was, well, all this glitter would fall off unless I put it on the big table. Mm -hmm. So that, um, generally speaking, it's all done on the wall, all of it. Just the pouring is done on the Yeah, just the pouring and, yeah, support, yes, Julia. So. I, I understand you've discussed your your hands-on process, but this particular body of work, for example, is quite thematic in its regard to the animals. So where does that generate for you um, when you're beginning a new series no, this is, I'm, I'm, this is it. I'm going to continue with this series. 
I'm going to just continue, okay? Because uh, I can't stop with the animals. But I, whether I put a person in it or not, I don't know. I had this puppet, so I put her in. I wasn't going to. I was going to have all animals. Although you could call the bear a man. Mm -hmm. yes. Maybe not the baby grizzly, um, but that bear, that bear, and this bear. But anyway, I was going to leave the the people out of it. But when I got this Indonesian puppet, I felt I had to have her in. So. And it, and is there a way that your your mulling about this continues when you're not in the studio? About that question? About the the um, what's driving the work? About no, I'm I'm just so passionate that I can hardly wait to begin a new one, and I have no mulling. Hmm. No mulling. I just get in there. Start. Okay. Yes. Would you tell us more about the paper in the vacuum? Yes, um, the paper is Moulin de Goo. I want to work on watercolor paper because it really would be good if I could. <laughs> and um, I, um, this is a good example. Um, when this gre green hair and didn't come out so well, I thought, I can't keep on going into it with more layers of watercolor because. Moulin de Goo doesn't like to that many layers. It's just drawing paper, or sometimes it's called print paper. But um, so I'm. But still, when I tried to do charcoal drawing on watercolor paper, it wasn't good. So I'm stuck with ten or yards of Moulin de Goo, you know, rolled up. And, and then you mount it somehow onto the I do. Um, uh, I put cheesecloth in that medium on the back, and you can touch it see that uh, it makes it as tough as canvas. Okay. Wow. Mm -hmm. And that's stapled down too. Yes, Anna. Okay. Oh, did Carlos call to you? I'm just noticing that the three on, on the wall where you're standing have lots of greens and blues, different to some extent from other paintings. So. I don't know why. Um, I was sick of that green, <laughs> even though Eric, Eric liked it. Oh, yes. Oh yes, but um, but I tried to contradict it. You know, it was too much green. Um, but once I thought uh, of this as a forest, so I felt when you go into a forest, there's a slight green light. So I had to have the green again. But um, no, my favorite color might might be uh, red or orange red. But uh, I have yet to imagine one beginning with orange red. But it's possible. <laughs> Yes. I'm guessing perhaps you used an airbrush on the uh, one in the back with the figure. Not this one. The, the yes, I used an airbrush, and most often I use watercolor pigment in the airbrush. Okay. Um, now, I might not have on on the prostitute from Amsterdam, uh, but I I did. This is watercolor because I I know my colors in watercolor in an airbrush. Color I don't, and it's acrylic, you know, and something I'm, I'm sensitive to watercolor. So the the um, maiden, uh, the woodland um, maiden there, she's um, airbrush, but she is watercolor for the airbrush. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, could you tell me uh, about the, the patterns on the faces that you have? Yeah, I. Um, yeah, we have a big collection of African art, and these are two masks uh, that we own. Only I translated them into woodblock print, a Cuba mask, and a, what? Pende. Uh, Pende mask, Pende mask. So that I love those, and so I just carved them as the man and the woman. Yes. And I repeated it, because print could be repeated. I, I use this
collage and objects and you sort of know what you want here and then grab something or you know I'm just uh, no I have um, big too much stuff okay. I have a mm -hmm. bags and boxes of stuff and I often go through them just like this you know mm -hmm. and say yes no yes <laughs> no and I said yes to the hat and Ellen said no and so, <laughs> you know, and so that um, you know so that I just am better at this now than I felt old and so experienced with it in the beginning I uh, would here with the uh, Venetian bee beads, and this is while well, Venice. I, um, uh, uh, Paul was sleeping, and then I just took the Venetian beads and threw them on the sheet, and then I did a drawing of where they landed. Mm -hmm. And so then, I this is my first beginning of putting um, objects on a drawing. And after that, um, it went pretty well. But gradually, I got better and better. Mm -hmm. Yes. How did you get the teapot? Um, did you cut it in half? And no, I didn't. Um, first, I made it in clay. Then I um, um, poured, pl made a plaster mold, and then I took watercolor, watercolor paper pulp and pressed it in. So this is not. I had other teapots, but this is just one. The one was left over. And it's a, it's a poem by um, Kimball Lecomte, and it's um, Odysseus made tea so sweet that all the creatures came to sniff and paw. Mm -hmm. And so w just with a, some lines like that, I was going to do a painting about that. Mm -hmm. So the teapot was in there and the steam, but after that I didn't know anything. I was going Yes. There was a piece I made it in Louisiana with the dog at the screen door, and the dog stood independently. Is what? Do you think that was like a, kind of a jumping off point for this this style of work, or did that really have nothing? Is that no, it it's. Um, I did in the past. I have a history, you know, a long history uh, of making art, so that. In the past, I also wanted to get the work out from the wall. And so it's the same impetus as this. Uh, I don't have any independent things standing here, but maybe I will, you know, because it could go with this, right. But I did a fair amount of that. Yes? Um, you said at the beginning that a measure of desperation is an ingredient in making art. Yes. And I was hoping we would have a paradoxical flowering of art now for the next four years. But my question, <laughs> my question to you, though, is um, you mentioned an outside reference for this one, the lines about the teapot. And I remember uh, when I saw that last week, of course, I didn't know that the teapot was not just an inspired edition like all of your editions. And I'm wondering whether you have outside allusions that the other paintings reference in it, because you haven't mentioned any other you know, lines of poetry, remembered bits of history. Well, obviously the prostitute, I yeah. saw her in Amsterdam. Um, sure, yeah. I saw the macaw, just something like that. I saw the macaw in um, New York City's zoo. Um, but do you have any other like literary references or anything? Because that one's no, so No, and I, I'm a big, I'm a really so, big reader. So. No, it's, Tintorento. this is about Venice. Tintorento? <laughs> what? Tintorento. Oh, no, here's, I'm trying to copy uh, Tintorello here, uh, uh, the <laughs> Massacre of the Innocents. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to have a, a really male looking male and that, that's what he, they were like uh, in mm -hmm. the Renaissance, so that uh, with little tiny legs, big chest, you know, and so that, um, there are some outside references. This is a um, lion from Venice. Mm -hmm. But um, no, I'm a big reader, and it could be a line, could inspire me again as possible. I read a lot, a lot of poetry. You have the most inspired eye, and I don't think planning is the necessary thing for you, because obviously at each juncture, you just see, and you make a wonderful choice. And I know such small details as the lower jaw on that boar over there, or that that just, mm -hmm. I don't know why, that throws yeah. me yeah. black lace that you're using for the bottom jaw.
Yeah. Well, um, here's some orangutan hair, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, it's just great. Yeah, it is. Yeah, uh, but anyway, um, I love those. I love those wild boars, mm -hmm. and I went to see them in a forest outside of Rome, and I photographed them, and we were lucky enough to have them not be far away. Mm -hmm. They came right up to the fence, and uh, I got a close look at them. Yeah. See, do you, how do you mount your paper do you, on your sheet? Yeah, they're mounted on what is called a strainer. It's a back frame. So it's just a back frame. And then I used to use Velcro, but it didn't hold as well. And now I use um, uh, just matte medium and cheesecloth, and it holds well. You know, around the board. You can peek around the sides uh -huh. to see, right? Yeah. So you use different things for different hmm? things? Different, different ways of mounting? Or all, all the same. Oh, all They're the all the same. same. Um, this is not. I, I couldn't, I wanted to do this drawing so badly, I couldn't wait to put the um, cheesecloth and matte medium on. I couldn't wait, so I just began, and it had to be framed then, in a, a different way. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, that's, that's it. <laughs>